Hi, Matt Emerson. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you, Wyatt? <laughs> I'm not bad. Uh, as I noted I'm earlier, I'm in my basement bunker and have been able to work from home and, and thankful for an opportunity to do that despite the major difficulties that many people are facing right now. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I'm excited to talk to you. I'm interested to talk to you um, because I, I've seen you online for a while and through publication. Well, I've read one of your publications, not, not the other ones yet. And I'm excited to talk to you about the idea of Baptist renewal, a resource uh, of retrieval theology and the rest. Uh, to start off, I just kind of wanted to ask you a little bit about yourself. Can you just tell people who you are, your background, your ministry, sure. whatever you feel comfortable saying? Yeah. Uh, so just, just I'm going to keep it short. My wife and I are from Alabama. Uh, we met in high school, Huntsville, Alabama, Grissom High School, Go Tigers. Both went to Auburn University, um, so there's lots of Auburn paraphernalia around my office, or Eagle. Uh, we, we were married in 2006, and then I uh, went to Southeastern for my MDiv and PhD and PhDs in Biblical Theology. Uh, after I graduated from Southeastern, uh, we moved to California, where I taught at California Baptist University for four years, uh, and then moved to Oklahoma Baptist University, which is where I currently am in 2015. Uh, I served as a professor, as assistant, and then associate professor of religion uh, for five years. And uh, just last month was named uh, the dean of the Hobbes College of Theology and Ministry. So I'm um, still teaching, still writing, but I'm also doing some administrative work here. Uh, our, pre our president, Heath Thomas, was promoted from that position. And so then uh, I moved up into the dean spot. And that's as brief as I can be, I think. I like it. Um... Now, you're part of this kind of Baptist renewal movement. I mean, there's a website that, uh, whatever, the Center for, Center for Baptist Renewal or whatever the exact title is. And you yeah. recently, sorry, what was it? That's right. Okay. Center for Baptist Renewal. And you recently have uh, co-edited a book called Baptist and the Great Tradition. Um, so I'm curious, what are you trying to accomplish with this book and really the broader movement of Baptist renewal? What, what is your goal? Sure. Well, the basic goal is to connect Baptist churches and pastors to the Christian tradition. Um, and, and that's, again, as sort of simple as I can put it, where we want to help connect pastors, interested laypersons, uh, churches as a whole. We want to help them connect with the Christian tradition, both in terms of doctrines that we think are helpful and important and beneficial, and in terms of uh, worship practices, liturgies, uh, historic liturgies that are, that are helpful for Baptists. Uh, we want Baptists to maybe have a better sense of our own history. Um, so I think we're going to get around to that at some point if we, if we can today um, with one of these questions. Uh, Baptists tend, at least in America, um, and at least with Southern Baptists, so I'm speaking particularly from my own context, we tend to um, know church history starting at around 1970. Um, and then, you know, and so for, for Southern Baptists particularly, that's a really important decade. Um, but, you know, if we know anything else about Southern Baptist history or even church history, it, it often doesn't go farther than, you know, 1900, maybe 1800. And then maybe if people are kind of into church history and Southern Baptist life, it's uh, one of the reformers. And, um, you know, we want to say, well, there's 1,500 years prior to the Reformation that's also important, and that also can help uh, us understand our place in the church and understand particular doctrines and understand particular worship practices. And not, not all of, you know, obviously, not everything that um, cer certain traditions have believed throughout space and time is going to be appropriated by Baptists, because then we wouldn't be Baptists anymore. Um, but there are certain um, doctrinal ways of formulating doctrine. There are certain um, worship traditions that we think are helpful, that would be beneficial, that, that could help uh, Baptist churches grow in health and maturity, um, and really in connection with the larger body of Christ. And that's really what we're about. We want to connect Baptists to the larger body of Christ, both historically and, and contemporarily. So it sounds like when you say kind of a Christian tradition or that idea, you mean not merely the last few hundred years, but really the whole scope of a, of a 2000, roughly 2000 year history of the church. Um, so that means you have this sort of uh, temporal depth to you, but there's also kind of a horizontal one as well in terms of 
a broader community of faith. Do you see this kind of Baptist renewal as wanting to work more with our brothers and sisters who are Presbyterian, Anglican, kind of a bit broader, or are you more kind of in that vertical stream in terms of the past? No, it's definitely vertical and horizontal. Um, on the horizontal level, I think that there are certainly tangible goals I'm sure we could map out. Um, for us, the main goal on that, on that horizontal level is, again, just to show, and again, I'm speaking particularly as a Southern Baptist, so when I say Baptist, I'm speaking from my own context, um, to show Baptists that we're connected to each other, um, and not just other Baptists or to other Southern Baptists or whatever, that we're connected to the entire body of Christ in particular ways. And that can be true in the fact that, say, we all affirm the same Trinitarian and Christological confessions, or it can be true in the, in the fact that we have uh, the same doctrine of scripture, or it can be true in the fact that we're participating in some of the same worship practices every Sunday. So whether it's reciting the Apostles' Creed or taking the Lord's Supper every week, those things connect us not just to Christians in the past, but to Christians throughout space and time. Um, and that, that's really what we're trying to do is, is situate our own particular Baptist tradition within the larger Christian tradition, both throughout time and now currently throughout space so geographically that's helpful now you're using the word tradition and and i would say you know i'm a baptist i am a baptist yeah i'm a baptist so i kind of understand a little bit of what you're talking about but there's a sense in our tradition that we're a bit suspicious of authority we're often individualistic congregational you know local church only yeah and the word tradition i think would make some of us feel uncomfortable can you kind of expand on that? Like, what do you mean by tradition and how does what you're saying fit in with a kind of a Baptist identity and maybe Baptist tendencies towards sure. that suspicion? Yeah. So first of all, on the, the point about Baptist being individualist and um, kind of suspicious of authority, um, I, I would want to say first that that wasn't true of all early Baptists. So there are some early Baptists and especially some early Anabaptists where that definitely is true. Um, but when you look at the English separatists and the Baptist movement that came out of English separatism, as well as some of the um, kinship they had with Anabaptists, and the, at least in the general Baptists in England, um, these, these confessions that they wrote were deeply rooted in the Christian tradition in the sense that they're drawing on Nicene Trinitarian formulations. They're drawing on Chalcedonian Christological formulations. They're drawing on um, the four ecclesial notes of the church uh, from the Nicene Creed. Right? So they're drawing on all these things to talk about these doctrines that they hold in common with all other Christians. Uh, and, and so there's not this deep, which I, I know exactly what you're talking about, and I agree that it's, it's prevalent um, in Baptist life, but there, it just wasn't um, articulated that way in, in er, much early Baptist thought. And I, so I would say that um, this, this deep suspicion of tradition and this kind of individualist mindset is really a product more, not necessarily just a Baptist thought, but it's really a, more a product of modernism and the Enlightenment. And it can be true of any tradition. Um, I, I think, you know, when you look at what has happened uh, in certain mainline traditions, or when you even look at what, what happens um, with some Roman Catholic thought, right? Nobody is uh, free of the influence of modernity and the Enlightenment um, in, in, in the sense that uh, we're autonomous individuals, this sort of thing. So <clears throat> when I talk about Baptist distinctives, like the ones you mentioned, where we're talking about uh, you know, believers' baptism, we're talking about local church autonomy, we're talking about freedom of church and state. Um, I prefer to put those in terms of personal responsibility before the Lord and Christ as king over all things. And right? so when I'm talking about believers' baptism, I don't want to put it in terms of I'm only responsible for myself. I, I do want to put it in terms of every, every individual stands before the Lord and is responsible for their stance toward the Lord. Um, when I talk about local church autonomy, I want to talk more about Christ's kingship than I talk about, you know, I don't want anybody telling my church what to do, that kind of thing, right? Christ is the king over this local church. When I talk about, and the same thing is true of, of uh, separation of church and state, um, it's, it's not the fact that um, 
you know, our faith has nothing to say to the government or vice versa. Um, you know, in other words, it's not that those two spheres never intersect. It, it is, though, the fact that um, Christ is king over the church, not the state. And, I, you know, there is some connection between those sentiments and the kind of reductio ad autonomy <laughs> that you see in modernity but they're not the same. Um, one of them is what I would say properly Baptist and also scriptural. Uh, the other is, you know, a, apart from Christ, just another set of um, secular ideologies that the world has succumbed to. Um, and we could say the same thing about a number of others, you know, ideologies. Um, it's it's not these two things are not to be equated um and so yes you do see baptists succumbing to the kind of autonomous individualism of modernity but i think if we go back to uh many of the early baptists who were we should say were prior to john locke and or at least contemporary with him in terms of their childhood years so they're not being influenced by his writing yet um if, the early Baptists were not drawing their notions of liberty from John Locke. And it is true that sort of a century later, century and a half later, especially in America, uh, Baptists did, and, and other American churches did, latch on to Lockean views of freedom. It is true that American uh, Baptists, uh, Baptists in America and other churches in America did lock on to the kind of pragmatic individualism that we see. But what I want to say is that doesn't mean that that's the same thing as what it means to be Baptist. Right. And it seems like we're always uh, part of the culture in which we live. There's always so somehow that we're being influenced. It's not the case that just because some Baptists or many Baptists are influenced by a certain understanding of freedom of Liberty, that that defines the entire movement. And, you know, there's, yeah. I was like 350 years of history, roughly of Baptists. And there's a kind of a rich diversity there as well that you can access. Right. Now you uh, personally, as a Baptist have done a lot of I don't know, work in terms of retrieval of looking into the past, resourcing the church today with the wisdom of the past. And a couple of areas that I know that you've done, I'm sure you've done more, but these are the two areas that I know are on the, in the area of eternal generation, which is mm -hmm. Trinitarian theology. And on the area of the descent, which is um, a book you published last year, I believe, right? Yeah, in December of 2019. Okay, so almost this year. <laughs> yep. So I'd like to focus on the first one first, and yeah. just kind of ask you, why do you, why do you as a Baptist, why is you as a as a professor as a person think eternal generation is so important, and how does that actually work out in terms of our theological thinking and and church life? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the first part of the answer to that question comes in, in relation to your previous question, which I didn't answer some of that on tradition. I mean, and just very briefly, I would, I would say that uh, tradition in, in a proper sense of the term, uh, and this is drawing on Heiko Obermann's categories, tradition one, tradition two. Um, tradition one says that uh, tradition is only authoritative insofar as it is derived from scripture. So scripture is the norming norm by which all other norms are normed. Norma normans non normata. Um, and what that means is that uh, scripture is, is the ultimate authority. We believe in sola scriptura. We're Protestants. Um, but that doesn't mean that there are not other kinds of authority that derive their authority from scripture. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about tradition. Tradition is only authoritative insofar as it is derived from scripture. And so with eternal generation, um, it's important to me because it's really the linchpin of the foundational tradition of the church, which is the Nicene Creed. Um, you, you don't have Nicaea without the concept of eternal generation. And <clears throat> so I want to take that seriously. You know, I, I want to I want to say that yes, creeds can be wrong, yes, confessions can be wrong, um, but 
the burden for overturning a creed or a confession is not my own individual exegesis of an individual passage of scripture. Uh, it would need, it would take the consensus of the entire church to overturn a creed to say, uh, you, you know what, we were wrong 1500 years ago or 1800 years ago, whatever. Um, this is, this is not biblical. Um, it, it doesn't, it doesn't stand or fall on me uh, to, to do that. So, when I think about tradition, um, I'm thinking about something that's derivative from Scripture, but also, especially in the case of the creed, something that has stood the test of time, uh, that Christians throughout space and time have affirmed these things, they have agreed on these things, and, you know, it's a matter of instead of being suspicious of a creedal line when it at first doesn't make sense, it's a matter rather of returning to the Scriptures along with the communion of saints and asking, well, how did, how did, this person or that person or these people understand eternal generation or some other concept to be biblical. And this is the same thing that I would say about the descent when we get there is that, you know, people have uh, challenged both eternal generation and the descent clauses um, in the creeds. And I would say the same thing to both. Um, it's not a matter of your own individual exegesis. If the church throughout space and time has agreed on this doctrine, uh, we need to return to the scriptures with the communion of saints and, and see what they've said about it. Now, you might not be convinced at the end, um, and I'm not sure I want to get into what I think about that, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, at least this sort of attitude of suspicion, this hermeneutic of suspicion that we have as moderns, which is not a Baptist distinctive. Being suspicious of other Christians is not a Baptist distinctive. Are you sure? Uh, uh, well, yeah. it's, it's not supposed to be. Um, and so, you know, we should rather have a hermeneutic of trust where unless we are just overwhelmingly convinced, like Luther was, right, uh, that this particular tradition is not biblical, we need to um, keep asking questions. So with eternal generation, that's one reason why I think it's important. The other reason I would say it's important is what I said at the beginning, which is that this, this for the um, pro-Nicene theologians in the fourth century, eternal generation, really more broadly, the eternal relations of origin. Uh, the Father is unbegotten, the Father eternally begets the Son, the Father and the Son eternally spirate the Spirit. That The eternal relations of origin, that, that doctrine was the linchpin of Nicene Orthodoxy. You do not have, uh, you, you do not have homoousios, one essence, articulated in a way that makes any sense unless you have the eternal relations of origin. So, you know, my, my issue with people who want to pick at eternal generation, eternal procession, um, is that, and say, okay, well, I affirm homoousios, but I don't affirm this, or I question this. What, they're, what, what they don't realize they're doing, I don't think, is they're actually taking out that pin that is holding homoousios together. Because without it, you've got, you've got nothing holding it together. Um, and, and what I think the pro Nicenes would say to that is, if you take it out, what else are you going to distinguish the persons with? Are you going to distinguish it with um, different levels of authority? Well, that means they're not one God in terms of authority. Are you going to distinguish them in terms of different, uh, you know, sets of consciousness? Well, now, once again, that means they don't have one will, which means they're not one God, right? So, you automatically, if you're pulling out the eternal relations of origin, you have a really hard time avoiding tritheism at that point, at least in my opinion. Uh, and I'm, again, I'm not saying that people who have questioned eternal generation are tritheists. I'm just saying I don't think we realize the kind of hermeneutical and theological implications of pulling on these threads that we think, ah, I don't see that in the Bible. So I'm going to still affirm what I think is important, but I'm not going to affirm this. Well, it doesn't really work that way. Uh, mm -hmm. Christian theology is a fabric. It holds together. You can't just pull on one thread and expect the rest of it not to unravel. So those are the two things that I would say about eternal generation. It's important to me because it's part of the rich tradition of the church in terms of the Nicene Creed. It's important to me uh, because it um, holds together Nicene Orthodoxy. But I think ultimately, thirdly, it's important to me because it's biblical. I'm thoroughly convinced that it's a biblical doctrine, and that's the most important point that this, this is taught in scripture. So those would be the three, three reasons I would say that I was really keen on talking about eternal generation. That's helpful. Um, just to kind of piggyback on that a little bit, can, can you just maybe give 
couple places in scripture or a scriptural pattern where you see eternal generation clearly? Sure. Because I, I can imagine someone hearing this and hearing what you're saying and, and just sort of like, well, how exactly is it biblical? And maybe sure. just briefly define the doctrine as well. Yeah. So the, the doctrine of the eternal relations of origin um, says that uh, the, the divine essence, um, the, the person subsists in the divine essence via their eternal relations of origin. So the father subsists in the divine essence as unbegotten. The son subsists in the divine essence uh, via his eternal generation from the father. That is, he receives or, or the father communicates the divine essence. There are various terms that you could use. Some, are, some people like certain terms more than others. I'm just going to keep it brief. Um, the son receives or is, uh, the father communicates the essence to the son and the father and the son um, process the spirit. So the spirit subsists in the divine essence via uh, being spirated by the father and the son and you know beyond that there's not a whole lot we can say um, in terms of what the doctrine means but this is the one and only way that the pro nicenes could distinguish the persons without collapsing into tritheism or subordinationism and they so it's important for that reason, but it's more important because it's in scripture, right? So it's, you know, they're not searching for a um, solution to a problem. They're affirming the solution that's already there um, as they're reading scripture. So in terms of scriptural support, you know, the biggest argument that uh, the pro Nicenes would have made is that the language of father and son already communicates something about the relationship between the father and the son. So the names of the persons um, already communicates something about their relationship. And so, you know, the way that it's important to go read primary sources. So if you're asking, okay, what's going on here? Go read Gregory of Nazianzus, go read Basil of Caesarea, go read Athanasius. Um, because we're not used to the kind of reasoning that they use, but what they would say is, all right, father and son mean something. God is revealing himself as father and of course spirit, but particularly with father, son, that means something. What does it mean for one person to be father, another person to be son, them to be distinguished from each other in that way, but also still be one God. Okay. Well, the fact that they're a father and a son and one nature, one, one essence, right? So um, they're father and son, but they have one essence. They're, they're both God equally, right? Okay, well, what are our options then about what father and son communicate? Well, does it communicate difference in authority, right? Because if you think about fathers and sons, fathers are in charge of their sons. Okay, so does father-son communicate difference in authority? Well, no, because... If they have differences in authority, then they no longer have one essence. Okay, and then they would go back to scripture and demonstrate these are the ways, these are the places where we would see father and son having equal authority. Well, does father and son mean that, um, say, the father begat the son in time, right? Because for humans, father and son, uh, the son comes after the father in time. But they would say, no, the son doesn't come after the father in time because the son is present at creation, before creation, right? So, you know, they would list scriptures out that would show the eternality of the son. And they would do that for a number of other options. And then finally, they would say, none of these work because they distinguish father and son at the level of essence. So the only thing that does work is the fact that a father begetting a son means that the father communicates his nature, his human nature to his son, All right? If you've got a duck and an alligator walking side by side, it doesn't matter if the alligator calls the duck his daddy. Uh, they're not, they don't share a nature, right? But if a fa father and son, that, that relationship communicates at least at a basic level, and that we can talk about adoption and all that, but at a basic level, father, son communicates um, the communication of nature from the father to the son. And so that that's, the biggest, um, I think, biblical argument. It means something. God is, God is telling us something with these names. 
But then you could go to Proverbs 8 and talk about um, the language of, of begetting, possessing uh, before the foundations of the world. You could go to um, John 5, <clears throat> uh, which is uh, probably easier. John 5, where um, the Father, uh, Jesus says about the Father, the Father has life in himself and has given it to the Son to have life in himself. And, you know, with that passage, we're talking about what does it mean to have life in yourself? It means that you're not relying on anybody else for life. That is, you just exist. Okay, well, the Father has life in himself. He's given it to the Son to have life in himself. Does, does the word given mean that the Son somehow didn't exist on his own and now exists on his own? Well, that doesn't make sense because if he was given the ability to exist on his own, he wouldn't be existing on his own. He would be existing by the power that the Father gave him, right? So that is communicating something eternal about the relationship between Father and Son. So these are the kinds of um, hermeneutical, biblical, theological arguments that uh, the pro-Nicenes would have used to support eternal generation. So, so maybe one way to put it then in kind of a summary form is it's a meditation on what it means for there to be one God who is Father and Son. I mean, spirit too, but father and son in, in this conversation. Yeah. And the answer is, well, if it's one God, there's a father and a son, they've always been father and sons. How do you describe that relationship? And the, and the answer would be, well, the father before and above all time has in some sense begot the son, but not in a human way, but in a divine, right. eternal, immutable, yeah. simple way. Uh, so that's helpful. That, that's something you try to retrieve uh, in your work and others, many others have too, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and I think that is a very important doctrine. I think I agree with you that it is, it's at least a linchpin in the pro Nicene doctrine. If you don't have that, I mean, it doesn't work. There's not a way to distinguish the persons. Um, th th now there's something else that you've really gotten into. I haven't read this book yet, but I, I plan to eventually, or hope to eventually, and that's on the descent. So um, I'm certain that most people listening to this who are not like professors or whatever, probably have never heard of the descent. So yeah. it, it might be useful just to start by saying <laughs> what it is. Sure. And then maybe afterwards, maybe we could do a follow up on how it works out or what it looks like in terms of sure. church practice. Yeah. So uh, the descent doctrine comes from a line in the Apostles' Creed and the Athanasian Creed he descended into hell or he descended to the dead. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion about what that means today, but in the book, I argue that historically, biblically, it means that Jesus experienced death as all humans do. His body was buried and his human soul departed to the place of the dead because he was and is the God man, his uh, divine, by virtue of his divinity, uh, he defeated death in entering into death. And uh, in, in rising from the dead, he changed the place of the dead from a place of expectation and waiting to a place of reality where the Messiah is there. He's bodily resurrected. The dead are with him or the righteous dead are with him. He wasn't tormented in hell. It doesn't mean that he uh, went down and released all of the people in, uh, in Hades, the place of the dead. You know, it's not universalism. It's not Jesus experiencing the torments of hell in his human soul. Uh, it, it's not, um, yeah, it, it's not the kind of caricatures that you sometimes get. Um, and that's really, I think, why a lot of evangelicals don't like that clause, or if they know about it, um, is because they think it means something that it really doesn't mean. So just at a basic level, Jesus experienced death like all humans do. And because he's the God man, he defeats death. That's, that's as simple as I can put it. You use the phrase about transforming the place of death. Um, what do you mean by that? Is it, are you kind of arguing that there's a transition from the how Shale's characterized? Yeah. Before Christ so, ascends and then afterwards. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And and so this is you know Ephesians four eight through ten that um, he led a host of captives. What is what is that talking about? Well, I think it's talking about the descent, which is a minority report these days. But um, I talk about the exegesis of the passage in the book. Um, and I think that when, when Ephesians, when Paul talks about uh, leading a host of captives in Ephesians, um, he's talking about the fact that paradise is necessarily changed, right? So um, not to get in 
all the gory details, but uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, especially in Second Temple Judaism and in the New Testament, the place of the dead was conceptualized as having different compartments. So you have paradise, the place of the righteous dead. You've got, um, sometimes it's called Gehenna, sometimes Hades, sometimes Sheol, which is the place of the unrighteous dead. And then you've got Tartarus, uh, prison for the evil angels. And so the descent doctrine historically, biblically says that Jesus descended to paradise, which is the righteous compartment. Um, and so he wasn't being tormented. He didn't experience suffering. Um, he's in the place of the righteous dead. Abraham's bosom is a, is a synonym for that. Um, but because, you know, like you see in Luke 16, all the dead are there. He can communicate with all the dead. He proclaims his victory to all the dead. And then when he rises from the dead, um, he's raised bodily. And really, as he ascends into heaven, he's raised bodily, ascends bodily. And the dead are with him. The righteous dead are with him in his bodily resurrection and ascension. Not bodily. You know, they, haven't, they haven't been raised from the dead. Um, but the place of the dead, the righteous place of the dead, is now changed from a place of expectation. We're waiting on the Messiah. That's why they're in the righteous compartment, because they have faith, right? So they're waiting on the Messiah to arrive. Well, now he's here. He's here in his descent in his human soul. He's uh, raised from the, the place of the dead in his resurrection. And then his ascension, uh, he's with the dead as well. And we see this like in Revelation 6, right? The martyrs under the throne. Um, and so the place of the dead has changed from one where they're waiting for the Messiah to now the Messiah is bodily in their midst. And so that's, that's why the tradition has uh, typically talked about the descent as a release of the captives. It's not because, I mean, you do find a few different snippets of people talking about universalism, but for the most part, they're very clear. They say the descent releases the righteous dead. And they don't mean by that that the righteous dead were being tormented prior to Christ. They don't mean by that that they were apart from God. They just mean that the reality that they're waiting for is now here bodily in their midst. And so you have the change from this talk about going down into the place of the dead to something like Paul, where he talks about being caught up to the third heaven. And this is this kind of spatial language where I don't think the biblical authors are communicating that there is an actual underworld and an, you know, an actual physical place that we can go up to, right? But they're using the spatial language to communicate um, the change in reality in the invisible realm where spirits dwell. So there's a, there's a sense in which uh, before Christ, everybody is in shale in the place of the dead. There's yep. a good reality, a bad reality there, however you want to conceive of it. But once Christ dies as a human being, mm -hmm. conquers death according to his divinity, all yep. those who were anticipating him, Abraham and so on, right. rise with him to what we understand to be heaven, to be with God around his throne room. Yep. There's a, in a real sense, a release of not cap of captives in terms of them being like punished as captives, but them as being captive, you know, by metaphor, because it prevented from the full yeah. experience of yeah. uh, closeness to the throne of God. Yeah. I mean, death is a prison, right? So uh, Jesus busts the doors down. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good, I like uh, that. Yeah. And, and so the, the, the prison doors are no longer locked for those who have faith, right? So Jesus has the keys. He, in Revelation 118, he, has, he now has the keys to death in Hades. Mm. Um, so there are, especially in the 20th century, there are people who take this kind of um, universalist move where they say, oh, well, the gates of hell are just totally busted down. Everybody's coming up, right? That's not what's being communicated. It, it is, you know, Jesus is still using the keys. He doesn't let everybody out. He lets the righteous dead out. Um, and then of course, at the resurrection of the dead, all the dead are raised some to eternal life and some to the second death in the lake of fire. Uh, and, and again, those, those compartments match up with, um, what we think about heaven and hell now in the immediate state. And then they match up with the final state and, um, the new heavens, new earth and lake of fire. Mm. So, so really in the end of the day, the descent is sort of the doctrine of, of Christ's victory over death. It's a, it's right. a compliment to the cross in a sense. It is maybe, maybe it's part of what the cross does. I suppose you could put it that way. It is explaining further how Christ conquered death, how he overcame it and how he redeemed the saints who are made perfect. Yeah. Right. 
and the heavenly yeah. Zion. Yeah, and you can think about it in in terms of Philippians two, uh, there at the end, where uh, Jesus is given the name that is above every name, so that every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth will confess that Jesus is Lord. And so the descent is his declaration of his victory and his kingship over the underworld, resurrection at second tier, just the earth, and then his ascension, he's king in heaven. Um, and so, uh, you know, often in the book, I, there's a graphic uh, where I, I show this. You think about the work of Christ in sort of a, a V shape, right? So he descends from heaven to earth and then from earth to the underworld. And then he is exalted from the underworld to the earth and then in, into heaven in the ascension. Um, so the descent kind of stands in that, kind, in that both in the nadir of his descent from heaven down into the underworld, but it also stands as the, the initial point of his exaltation. Um, so, yep, yeah, it's victory. So I can think of a couple of implications. One would be that it, it helps give hope. Mm. We know where we're going, what's been conquered for us. Yeah. I also think that it probably helps us to celebrate as a church Easter because we're mm. understanding when he dies, you know, good Friday, uh, it, that something's happening. We're, we're celebrating. Not, there's a bit of, there's mourning that he's, he's dead, but there's also victory. Right. Death. So could you maybe just kind of tease out some ways you think this practically affects Christian worship and spirituality? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the the thing I emphasize in the book is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it's it's a very pastoral doctrine. So Jesus has already gone into the valley of the shadow of death before you, and he's come out the other side. And so even as you enter into uh, death, you you don't have to enter into it with fear. Uh, because Christ has already been there and already conquered it for you. Now, now, of course, that's for those who are believers, right? If you're a believer, Christ has already gone through the valley of the shadow of death ahead of you and uh, is the light guiding the way for you through it. And he's already rose from the dead, so there's hope on the other end. But, you know, at funerals, right, we often sort of focus on that ultimate victory, which is perfectly appropriate because the New Testament focuses on resurrection, right? I mean, the, the, our ultimate hope is resurrection from the dead. But in the meantime, while your loved ones are being placed into the ground or you yourself are facing death, we can, we can look at those events and say, yes, that we, we, we grieve, but not as those without hope and hope, not just in the ultimate resurrection. Of course, that's ultimate hope, but also right now we have hope that those who die in Christ, they're, are, they're with Christ around the throne as the saints who are dead. Um, but they're also, they also, we also have hope that Jesus has already done this. He's experienced it with us uh, and for us. He, this is not something that he doesn't know about, right? This is why it's important that he stays, and one of the reasons why it's important that he stays dead for three days. He knows what it's like not just to die, but to remain dead, right? He didn't die on the cross and then pop right back up he dies on the cross and he's dead for three days he knows what it's like to go into the place of the dead and he's gone there before us and conquered it um you know and i i would say that so it's a really pastoral doctrine as people are facing death whether it's their own or a loved one um i also think like you said it emphasizes christ's kingship he's king even over this ultimate power or really not ultimate, but this, this, this superpower that we're, that all humans fear naturally. Uh, he, he's king over death. He's king over the realm of the dead. He, the place that is the most opposed to God's reign, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, Jesus has conquered it. The, the person, the, the, the entity that is most opposed to God and his rule in the Old Testament and the New Testament, death. And I'm not trying to say that death is a person, but, uh, you know, this, this, this concept, this entity, whatever, of death, uh, the fact of death, he's been conquered by Christ. Um, so it emphasizes Christ's kingship. Um, I also think it helps us um, theologically with who Jesus is as a human being. 
Um, in the early church, the descent clause is often emphasized in relation to situations where Apollinarianism was an issue. Uh, so Apollinarianism is a heresy that says that the son only assumed a human body and not a human soul. Um, and of course, the descent affirms that Jesus descends in his human soul to the place of the dead. And so what better doctrine is there to combat the heresy of Apollinarianism uh, than the descent clause where Jesus is descending in his human soul? So those are all, I think, important ways that the descent impacts pastoral ministry. It impacts our vision for uh, who Jesus is. It impacts how we think about Christology. It's really, it's really a crucial doctrine in a lot of ways. Mm. Well, that's helpful. I think, you know, after you hear it explained, it makes a lot of sense. And it sort of reminds me, uh, I think, of 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul re-narrates the gospel in short form. He affirms that Christ died, mm -hmm. rose, but sometimes you overlook that it affirms that he was buried. Mm -hmm. according to, uh, I think according to scripture, it says with the burial as well. Like, my brain's not yeah. quickly connecting. No, it, yeah, but... He died according to the scriptures. Yeah. He okay. was buried. He was raised according to the scriptures. Yeah, so all that's according to scripture. So yeah. there's a sense in which uh, the descent kind of overlaps with that burial clause there, that, that that's right. word. And yeah. it, it really is part of the good news. It is part of the proclamation. That's right. Christ lived for us. He died for us. He stayed dead for us. He rose for us. He yep. ascended for us and he'll return for us. Yep. So, so now we have something to celebrate on Saturday besides Easter egg hunts. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> Both are good, but uh, yeah, right. this one might be slightly better. Yep. Um, that's all helpful. So earlier, you, when we talked about turn generation, you mentioned you should read some of the fathers um, yourself. Mm -hmm. And now we're talking about descent. Could you just kind of maybe just books that come to the top of your head to recommend? Like what books should people read if they're interested in these topics? Yeah, so on... Uh, Eternal Generation, I, I would say read uh, Athanasius against the Arians, uh, read Gregory of Nazianzus' Five Theological Orations, uh, read Gre Gregory of Nyssa uh, on Not Three Gods, read Basil of Caesarea on the Holy Spirit, read Athanasius and Serapion on the Holy Spirit, um, or, or Athanasius' Letters to Serapion and then Didymus the Blind on the Holy Spirit. Sorry, I said that way wrong. Um, yeah, I mean, those are all, and, and there's some dissent stuff in there in each of those, but uh, the emphasis is on eternal generation. So those would be good for eternal generation. On the dissent, um, Melito of Sardis is one of the earliest uh, really Christian writers that we have, uh, but he, he has a sermon on Passover in which he mentions uh, very, very clearly the dissent a couple times. Um, in a very compelling way. I mean, all the people I just mentioned have various sermons and homilies and poems uh, that mention the descent. I, I just presented a paper on the descent in fourth century, some fourth century thinkers, um, and and I could you know compile a list maybe and and shoot it your way or something. But um, the, I would just say read as much of those four people as you can: Athanasius, the two Gregs, and Basil. And uh, you'll be good. Good advice. Um, now, your books, can you just name them so people can hear them said, maybe Google, Google them afterwards? Yeah, so the Descent book is He Descended to the Dead, an Evangelical Theology of Holy Saturday. And that's IVP, academic. Um, I have written, uh, it's like a, I don't know how to describe it. It's an edited volume that has three sets of contributors on the Trinity and it's called Trinitarian theology. Uh, and it's me and Luke stamps as one set of contributors. Uh, and then Malcolm Yarnell is a second contributor and Bruce Ware is the third contributor. And it's dealing with this issue of, um, the eternal subordination of the son relation to gender roles, all that kind of stuff. Um, the, the book about Baptist Catholicity that you mentioned, uh, is Baptist in the Christian tradition and uh, toward an evangelical Baptist Catholicity. Here's the, I don't know if we're showing this video, but here's yep. the sent book. Um, and then before that, I've got, you know, on a Toronto generation, I have an essay on Proverbs eight in, uh, Fred Sanders and Scott Swain's edited volume, retrieving eternal generation. Uh, and then beyond that, if you want to talk about biblical theology some other time, we can talk about the story of scripture, uh, mm. 
I got a little book on revelation between the cross and the throne. So, <clears throat> yep. Well, that's helpful. I'm sure those listening can Google and we can maybe put some of the links in the show notes so people can find those. Thank you so much, Matt, for talking. That was helpful and good. And I hope more Baptists get into uh, Baptist renewal. Absolutely. Thanks, Wyatt, for having me. I appreciate it.